Back in church. Lesson number three in this series on the 23rd Psalm. He supplies my needs. Does anybody have any needs? <clears throat> now I feel pretty confident that we all know that the 23rd Psalm is not evidence for a prosperity gospel. While David did become king, and his son was probably among the richest, if not the richest men, men to ever live, this has been the exception and not the rule among those who have followed God throughout history. The author of Hebrews lists some of God's most faithful followers and describes them like this in Hebrews 11, verses 36 through 39. And others had, a, had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Now this, is, this pretty much comes from the lessons that we just closed out on, but I don't think anybody would mistake these descriptions for someone like Bill Gates or Oprah Winfrey. <clears throat> Living in dens and in caves. Their clothing was made with their own hands, and their shelter was what they could find in the wilderness. Yet these were considered among the most blessed and highly favored among God's people. All the same, these would likely say with David, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What did Jesus Himself have to say about our needs? In Matthew 6, 25 and 31 through 33, <clears throat> Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than body than raiment? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus assures us that our needs will be met if we follow Him. But our actual needs are far fewer than what many would like to think they are today. Food and clothing are our only actual needs according to Jesus. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Paul agrees with Jesus when he says in 1 Timothy 6 and 8, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Some might choose to argue that Jesus promised us far more than this when they read in Mark 10, 28 through 31. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake in the Gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and last first. But if we dig just a little deeper we'll have a better understanding of just exactly what it was that Jesus was saying here. First, this promise was to those who left or surrendered things that they already had to begin with. And when we read the book of Acts, we get a better idea of just exactly what it was that Jesus meant. Many people did give up houses and lands for the sake of the gospel. But what came of that willingness to suffer for the sake of God's will? The book of Acts tells us that they had all things common. We may have experienced something similar if we allowed a church member to stay at our house while they were visiting 
far from their own home. Or perhaps we have visited another area and stayed with church members. If so, we now have the potential to say that we have homes wherever there may be church members. And our houses are not our own, but we share them with those who are in need. Sharing the products of their lands or their livelihoods would be the same thing. Of course, our families will increase in the same way. I didn't have you, the majority of you, as brothers and sisters until you came here. Until I joined the church. When I became a child of God, you became my brothers and sisters in the Lord. So what I had just one brother. And now I've got multiple brothers and sisters right here, far more than I had to begin with, because I'm a child of God. And if we're children of God, then we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. So yes, our families have increased. Also notice that Jesus says that our mothers and brothers and sisters will increase, but not our wives. Hallelujah. <laughs> 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 We may be able to treat each other like mothers and brothers and sisters, but no one is to share that special marriage bond beyond their own spouse until death breaks that covenant. Just two more things I want us to focus on here in the words of Jesus. First of all, these things are promised to be in conjunction with persecutions. Yes, the church will share her wealth among her membership, but those who witness our faithfulness to, to God will seek our destruction. And just as Saul, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, many will believe that they are doing the work of God by doing so. This persecution will not come from the secular world, but from those who claim to follow God. Has there ever been a time that persecution came from outside the church? Look at history and you'll clearly see that persecution comes from those who claim allegiance to God. Certainly God used the secular armies of other nations to discipline His people when they failed to serve Him. But this isn't persecution. Persecution is unjust treatment for our faithfulness. And it invariably comes from those who believe they are serving God faithfully. Second is a warning against such behavior. Jesus said, but many that are first shall be last, and the last first. When we seek our own benefit at the expense of others, it will cost us our souls. But when we seek to benefit others at our expense, God will reimburse us from His eternal storehouse. If the Lord is truly our shepherd, then we will not even consider our own want. If the Lord is our shepherd, we will know that anything we do for the benefit of others will bring Him glory. We know that even if what little we have is needed by someone else, if we will be faithful to share it, we will not go hungry. In fact, we'll have more to fear of going without ourselves if we refrain from giving until it hurts. I shall not want is a statement that comes from our intimate knowledge that God will never fail us as long as we look to Him to supply our needs. As a result, we cannot refrain from reaching out to others knowing what God has already done for and through us. The attitude of this world is to lift ourselves up at the expense of those around us. This attitude is antichrist and opposes everything that Jesus stands for. The I shall not want attitude reaches out to lift up others to our own level at our expense. This is exactly what Jesus did for us as fallen humanity. And He expects us to follow His lead and do likewise. As long as we do, He will supply for our every need. I'm sorry, I need to get through that. I got a comment back in the back there. Okay. <clears throat> in a commentary here. David wrote the 23rd Psalm having a thorough knowledge of sheep and their needs. I shall not want. What do sheep have want of? 
necessities for sheep are food, water, and protection from danger, extreme elements, and predators. However, by saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He seems to indicate that he is perfectly content in the care of the Lord and with whatever it is that he provides. Can we honestly say that and mean it? Golden Truth, Psalms 23 and 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Commentary Part 1, Individual Needs <clears throat> Met. Part A, Defining Wants and Needs. Matthew 6 and 33. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The definition of a need is to lack something required to be in want. This word want, when used in this way, means to be without or to be deficient in. The state of being without the necessities of life. A provider is one who supplies or furnishes something that someone is lacking. God is our provider, the supplier of all our needs. God knows the things that we need. When we completely trust Him to provide those things, then we can truthfully say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now this is certainly one of the biggest issues in the world today. Understanding what we need. <laughs> this lesson used a few interesting words in this section. Something required and necessity. These are things that we are promised when we serve God as we should. They are things that humans cannot live without. Our continuing existence depends on their availability. This understanding is critical to our spiritual survival in this world that is so totally focused on comfort and convenience. Needs may not be what we would like, but that doesn't alter their nature in the least. Part B, distinguishing between wants and needs. Philippians 4 and 11, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, said, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have, done, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. But I have all and abound. I am full having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an owner, odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 4, 11 through 14 and 18 and 19. <clears throat> it would seem that godliness with contentment is great gain because godly without contentment Godliness without contentment cannot exist. It's easy for us to be content when all is well. But when the bills are due and the paycheck is short, contentment may be a little bit more elusive. When the pantry and the fridge are as empty as your bank accounts, how can you even imagine a time of contentment? Just as Paul, both David and Jesus can relate to these situations. David may have become king later in life, but he spent weeks in the field watching his father's sheep, not knowing where his next meal would come from, or if a wild beast or an enemy were lurking in the darkness. Jesus said in Matthew 8 and 20, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Yet like Paul, both were content because they knew the source of their daily needs. They could rest safe in the knowledge that no matter how things looked, God would see to their needs and would fulfill 
His plan for their lives. True contentment cannot come from a bank account, a job, a retirement plan, or an insurance policy. These things have a way of disappearing when least expected and when they're most needed. But God will never fail. He doesn't run out, dry up, expire, or lapse. If He is the source of our contentment, then that contentment is fully assured. And even if we do go hungry, God can use that for His benefit, His glory, and our benefit. How could we ever think to put our trust Anywhere else? Yes. I'm going to go ahead with my comment slash question <clears throat> from earlier. Uh, we know that um, the Bible says um, with food and rain that there would be content. And um, I know that a lot, some churches have like clothing ministry and food, you know, food bank and these kind of things. And <coughs> In our day and age, I don't see that many people, I don't see anybody running around without any clothes on. Right. So I'm guessing everybody that's even in this town that might be poor have that. You know, I don't know about food, but I have a hard time drawing the line, and maybe I'm the only one on this earth that does, but when people come in and <clears throat> or are out on the street asking for different things or come in needing gas in our gas tank or um, we've had a couple come in I think it's been a couple of times since we went to church mm-hmm. here where they're, they obviously weren't married and they were needing a hotel room to stay for the night and I just have you know and I have to really pray and ask the Lord you know direct me in this mm-hmm. because you know I'm having we're, we all all of us work in here right now, and we all have bills, and we all have to pay our bill, and the Bible, you know, the Lord doesn't want us in debt, but he knows that, you know, sometimes we have to be in debt, and I'm striving not to be in debt, but we have to also make sure that the obligations that we've signed our name to, that we've got everything paid for and different things like that. So what I'm trying to say is, when people ask us for this, that, and the other, you know, I want to be nice and give to everybody. You know, without judging, without whatever, but I have a hard time distinguishing do they really, really need this? Or are they just coming to someone that they think will give them a handout? You know, and I legitimately want to help people. Well, Jesus fed the 5,000 and He knew that some of them were there just for the free food. Right. He, he, Jesus knew. There was no question in His mind He was a Son of God. And He even mentions that later. You know, if anybody's hungry, I'll, I'll give them and, some food. And that's, that's the point. We, we need to be sure that what we're doing is supplying for needs. To hand someone a $10 bill that may be what God is telling you to do at that point. But I've also heard that there have been multiple times where an uh, individual come up and say, okay, well, I need, I need $10 because I need groceries. You know, okay, well, I'll tell you what, if you'll get in the car with me, I'll take you down wherever you want to go and I'll, I'll load up a couple of bags for you. No, 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 I just need $10. Well, I can't help you. Well, I, because some, some, some of those, we don't know what they're going to do with the money. If, if you go and take them and, and fill up their car with gas, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll go get you a can and carry it back. And I'll get you a can of gas. Some people don't even have debt. They just won't. And it, it, this isn't about debt. I know. This but isn't about I'm debt. Just thinking we have obli- and, and, and we do have obligations, and that's why we need to make sure that our obligations are fulfilled. But that part of our obligation to be fulfilled. When we said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, part of the obligation that we took upon ourselves was to give freely of ourselves. And as far as I'm concerned, when we sign for the house, when we sign for the cars, those are debts to man. Those, those are minuscule. Those are irrelevant compared to the debt we owe to God. 
the debt I owe to God is far <clears throat> greater than any lease agreement, than any uh, uh, house payment, than any electric bill. Because God gave me the opportunity to have that house, to have that car, to, to be able to pay that electric bill. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. My debt to Him is far greater than my debt to the electric company or, or to the uh, bank. And so we have to make sure that we're not... Jesus specifically spoke about this as well. He, he was talking about, uh, specifically, He was talking about children giving to their parents. Say, oh, I, I can't give to you because what I, what I was supposed to give to you is I'm just giving it to God instead. It's Corban. And He condemned them for their behavior. We have to make sure that what we're doing is not that. We're not, oh, I can't give to you because I don't, I don't like the life you're living. I'm, I don't like the, the, the way you're dressed, the, the tattoos, the jewelry, the double marriage. I don't like these things, so I'm not, I'm not going to give to you. I'm going to give it to God instead. And God is saying, give to those in need. Give. Give of yourselves. Well, you know, the Bible says confess your faults. That's just something no, that and, I... I struggle with. Absolutely, it's something that we should struggle with. It's something that we well, should struggle with. Because I don't know where to draw the line. Sometimes I have to say, Lord, help me to and know. There are times when we can't. There are times, there will be times when we can't help somebody else. They may have a situation that there's nothing we can do anything about. And we have to acknowledge that. Uh, but if there is something that we can do, and feel good about, and, and not violate our conscience as children of God. Jesus says that we're to do it, and He'll make sure that our needs are supplied. Yeah? James used the illustration of this situation that Sister Jane was talking about. He used this as an illustration according to our faith. Right. He said, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doeth it profit? Right. We need the help of God Absolutely. to operate our faith. Absolutely. As, you know, as it should be operated. Uh, you know, I, I like the, the, the lesson... Uh, you know, as I read it, uh, the, the verse here in Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Right. Uh, that one particular need mm -hmm. there is pointing out that every one of us, our greatest need first and foremost is of the Lord. Right. Uh, and a lot of people, they put emphasis on what they think they need. And, and we may, you know, look at one another or brother or sister and try to just try, try to determine what they uh, what they actually need. Well, first thing everybody needs is Jesus. Right. Uh, but we do need the Lord's help and direction in in how to handle these situations. And yeah. you know, sometimes there's been there's been cases that I I didn't feel led to. Uh, to help mm -hmm. in that manner. Right. And there have been cases that I felt compelled of the Spirit of the Lord Absolutely. to help that man. Absolutely. Or help that woman. Mm -hmm. And so we do need the Lord's help. In Absolutely. In I, love, I love the way Jesus dealt with sinners. Uh, and I love the fact that He is to be our example in these things. Salvation is a number one need that we have. And Brother Ammon said, and I don't know where he got it from, but he always said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And, and I think that, that's the attitude that Jesus had in his dealings with sinners. And I'm, I'm not talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, I'm talking about sinners on the street. That woman caught in adultery. <clears throat> when he dealt with them, he dealt with their immediate need. And when he dealt with their immediate need, whether it was the feeding of the 5,000 or the, or, the, or the healing of, this, of the, the captain, the guard who Peter cut his ear off, whatever it was, uh, Jesus saw to their immediate physical secular needs. And what that did was that opened the door to his ministry. And, and that gave them, wow, this, this person helped. 
Why did they help me? What, what is it about this person that makes them different from somebody else? That opened the door for the ministry so that they could receive knowledge of the truth because <clears throat> they felt His compassion. And when souls feel our compassion, they'll be much more open to receive the gospel than, than when they feel our condemnation. And I, I know I've spoken about that in the past, the, the condemnation that I have felt from people who call themselves children of God didn't make me want to get saved. It made me want to get away. It made me want to run away as fast as I could. I was already under condemnation. I didn't need their condemnation as well. I was already under God's condemnation. I needed someone to reach out in love. They didn't have to give me anything. They just had to show me love. They, had to show compa they needed to show compassion. And when someone showed compassion on me, it opened the door for me to receive what the important things that God had for me. I don't know where it is. I've been hunting. Yeah, I heard you hunting. But uh, I know somewhere it says if anybody asks of you, give. Mm -hmm. And if somebody takes from you, don't ask for it back. That's Sermon on the Mount. That's, yeah. yeah, that's that's Matthew 5, See, 6, in 7. That, in that scripture right there, that says that. So I'm think, I think it's the food and raiment part because I'm thinking nowadays, you know, we don't know how to survive without our electricity on. We, you know, back when the Bible was written, they didn't have electricity, so that wasn't a need per se. But nowadays, electricity is pretty much a need because we don't know how to function without it. You know, and it doesn't say anything about, you know, if the kid is sick, you know, Make sure they are what? taken to the doctor. If a kid is sick, our faith needs to be strong enough. Right. We can pray for them to them pray be healed. Be healed but if Done. Not, I'm just saying, you know, somebody come in and say, my child <clears throat> is sick. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we pray and our faith is not there. We just need to be open to receive what God has for us because we are vessels. That's, that's the entire in, intent of our, our being here. Uh, we, I had a... A uh, guy taught Bible study, and I love what he said. When God saves you, He doesn't immediately take you to heaven because there's a purpose in your life. You're to be a vessel. You're to, you're, your purpose is to share what you have, to, to pour out what He pours in. Whatever it is that God would have us to do, we have to be open to receive that first and foremost. Our salvation is critical. Once we receive that salvation, we need to understand what it is that God would have us to do with it. Not all of us are called to be teachers or pastors or, or whatever, but we are all called to do something for the Lord. And we're not just called into, out of sin into salvation to sit in a church pew on Sunday and Wednesday. We're called to be Christians 24 hours a day, seven days a week, wherever we are, whomever may be around. And we need to be open to God to receive what it is that He would have us to do with His blessing, with His benefit He has given us in our salvation. I'm gonna... hey, Brother Chris, as a person that's been around or in a place to where a necessity is mm -hmm. hard to come by, mm -hmm. prison, a toothbrush is hard oh, to come yeah. by. Yeah. Well, when the Christian people and the, the Christians come, and guess who gives the toothbrushes out and the, the name brand the other? Yeah. And the name brand soap. Right. It's the Christians, the church people, mm -hmm. who come in to give to the prison inmates. And that opens and that, opens the heart. You don't know how many people. <clears throat> right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That are saying, like, they depend on the church people. Right. There, you know? And it's. It, there's a lot of people been saved just from toothbrush. Praise the Lord. It's yeah. it's amazing what what little it takes yeah. for us to make a difference it's in the lives of some individuals. We just you have know, to be open. I shut up all my vows <clears throat> of compassion and don't help yeah. no, anybody. No, not at all. But <clears throat> sometimes when you've got this one coming, this, you know, it, sometimes it comes in spurts, and you're like, uh oh. Well, you know, I'm going to put in my spurts. <laughs> if if we don't have to give. We can't give. And I guess that's why the Bible says in First Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. That's exactly pray, right. And pray that the Lord will direct us if, anything. Like, this, even if somebody this, don't ask. This whole series of lessons is about knowing our shepherd. If we have the relationship that we need to have with our shepherd, he'll first off supply our needs. 
And we'll have that relationship not only so that we can talk to Him, so that we can hear Him when He speaks to us and gives us the direction that we need. There is not a chance I'm going to get through this lesson today. I appreciate all the comments. It's, it's been great. It's been really good. But one, one more simple little thing. God will also direct us to give when someone's not even asking. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's why we need that relationship with God. That pray without ceasing relationship. That prayer is not a one-way street where we just ask God, what should I do? Give me this. Help me with that. It should also be understanding that prayer is a two-way street. We also need to receive from God what it is that He would have us to do. It's funny, you know, the Bible tells us not to even take thought for tomorrow. Right. So we have a little money in our pocket and somebody comes up to us. And they say they have a need. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking about, what about yeah. tomorrow? All right. And the, when you talk about Excuse what me. the Bible says, you've got to rightly divide Absolutely. the Word of God. Absolutely. There's a lot of content in there. Yes, indeed. But having the Spirit, that's why we need the Spirit to lead and guide us Absolutely. You know, in all things. Because faith evolves everything. Absolutely. You know, and not taking the thought for tomorrow, not laying up treasures here on earth. There's a lot that can be said. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not going to get through this lesson. I'm going to try to get through my notes. Hope everybody's read the lesson. I'm going to read this, at least the first part of this next paragraph. <clears throat> People today seem to have trouble distinguishing between must have and would like to have. For example, around the turn of the 20th century, and just for anyone who's confused about that, the turn of the 20th century, that's, that's the end of the 1800s to the beginning of the 1900s. A survey indicated at the beginning of the 1900s that there were fewer than 20 things most people felt were essential to life. A similar survey conduct conducted several decades later revealed that a list of must-haves had grown to almost 100. Now, I couldn't find the source of this study, but I do want to point out that the lesson said several decades later. Now, you could stretch the word several and imagine that second study to be in 1950. Has the world changed any in the last 70 years since 1950? I would argue that the world we live in today is vastly different from just 30 years ago. As a nation, have we become less reliant on non-essential things? Or have we added to the list of unimportant things which we now think of as critical to our daily living? We feel their absence as a void in our lives when we cannot obtain what others have. This only adds to the general feeling of discontent that drives us as a nation further into debt. Rather than helping us to feel more fulfilled, the more we have, the more empty and meaningless life becomes. Life has turned into a never-ending quest for more and more of the very things that lead us into misery. And sadly, the majority keep pressing forward deeper and deeper into despair, unaware that the things that they are seeking will never truly satisfy. <clears throat> this is why when the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want because we'll understand that <clears throat> the void in our lives will only ever be perfectly filled by His presence. And the more we seek after stuff, the further we drive both Him and contentment away from ourselves. All right, and going down just above part two. He is my, he is my rock, he is my fortress, he is my deliverer, he is my God, he is my strength. He is my buckler, he is my salvation, he is my high tower. Similarly, in the six short verses of the 23rd Psalm, the personal pronoun my and similar words me, mine, and I are used 17 times indicating the personal relationship God wants to share with each of us. <clears throat> now, I know I've been guilty of thinking that God has far more important things to deal with than my little problems. Anybody else understand that feeling? 
And I feel pretty certain I'm not the only one who's done so. This psalm should remind us of the personal relationship that God wants to have with each of us. He's never too busy, so busy, that He will not hear our cry. Elijah was familiar with this wonderful characteristic of God. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the prophets of Baal had been praying for hours with no response when we read in 1 Kings 18 and 27. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awake. If this was really a God who had power to do anything, he would have already. But Elijah knew that his God was the only, one and only true God. He was able to do all things without any of the distractions of life as we might know them. God is not hindered by time or space since his abode lies outside the realm of both. God wants us to trust that when we call, He will answer. It may not always be exactly what we want to hear, but it will be for our benefit. I'm going to read just a little bit more than what's there. John 3.16, verse 17 as well. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. The most important aspect we need to glean from God's plan for salvation is that none of us were worthy to begin with. Often what happens is that we forget that we too were once sinners. If you ever hesitated to reach out to someone after witnessing the depth of their sin, this is exactly what has happened. <clears throat> Excuse me. This cheapens the debt that was paid for us and minimizes the value of the blood of the Son of God. Yet this is the most critical need for every living soul on this planet. As our pastor pointed out earlier, water, food, clothing, and shelter will have very little value when the soul departs from this earthly tabernacle. We need to understand the unequaled importance of this need, not only for ourselves, but for those who seem least worthy of receiving it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Until we have a solid grasp of this concept, our own salvation may not be as certain as we believe it to be. Jesus was willing to die for the very ones who are nailing Him to the cross. And it would seem that the majority of those who claim salvation, also feel justified in withholding the good news from those who might, not, who might hold a different opinion concerning worldly matters. Jesus' blood far outweighs any differences humans may hold to. There is no greater need in the world today than for souls to understand the depth of the love that God, the Good Shepherd has for every human alive today. It's not God's will that any should perish. If we believe this, nothing should hinder us from doing our part to help the lost understand their need for God. The lesson tells us God before the foundation of the world knew that man would have this need, and in loving kindness He made provision. Earlier the lesson described how God send rain, sends rain on all of us. I want to read that actual passage from Scripture. <clears throat> And add a little to the context, add a little of the context. Matthew 5, 43 through 45. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. <clears throat> that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. It's normal for us humans to, to love those who love us and be against those who come against us. When Jesus says that God sends both rain and sun on everyone, He isn't describing the good and the bad that we all experience in life, but only the good things. Both sun and rain are required for crops to grow. This would have been clearly understood by those to whom it was first spoken. 
only rain or only sun will destroy any crop, even though both are good and important and necessary. But a perfect mix will cause them to thrive. <clears throat> and what's the context of this passage? Jesus is telling us how to treat our enemies or those, or those who are opposed to us. I have to say that sadly, this is not the behavior I see from the majority of those who would claim salvation. Scroll through Facebook for a minute and see that anger and not the love of God is motivation for the majority of posts. Why are we to respond to hate with love? Jesus said that it is so that we can be the children of our Father which is in heaven. Jesus said elsewhere that children will behave in the same way as their father. God gave his all to save those who hated him. If we're his children, we'll do likewise. Our behavior will reveal the wor to the world just who it is that we serve. Jesus opposed the religious world who claimed a knowledge of God's word and fell short of God's will. But he loved the sinners who only opposed God openly and ignorantly. If we are truly God's children, we will do likewise. The entirety of the Old Testament describes man's failure to reach God by his own ability. Throughout it, God sent the shadow of animal sacrifice to reveal the culmination of the plan he set in order before time began. <clears throat> One more, I think it's just one more thing I want to read here real quick. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1 and 29. Jesus came to defeat the power sin has used to overcome the people of God. Yet, is there really a difference between the behaviors described in the Old Testament and so-called <clears throat> modern Christianity? I'm talking about so-called Christianity, not true Christianity. <clears throat> It appears that most nominal Christians today have conformed more to the behaviors of the Sadducees and Pharisees of Jesus' time than to Jesus Himself. Jesus came to take away the sin of the world, not to justify self-righteous behavior. If we hope to truly become the children of God, then we need to follow the example of Jesus and recognize our own shortcomings for the benefit of the lost souls who surround us, both in and and out of the religious world. I don't know that this lesson came across anything like what the author intended it to, but this is what God gave me. I hope that it had something, some benefit to, to you, and I'm going to be quiet now as so I'm about two minutes over.